Welcome to the Cybersecurity TLDR show, where we save you time by providing you the too long didn't read summary of cybersecurity topics and news. You can find us on YouTube with video and all the popular podcasting platforms for audio on the go. Now let's get over to your host, John Good. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm your host, John Good, and this is your Threat Intel Briefing for December 25th, 2022 through December 31st, 2022. This is the last Threat Intel Briefing for the year 2022, because obviously New Year's is coming up and then we'll roll over into 2023. So we're obviously gonna keep going. Things are not stopping, but this will be your last briefing for 2022. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. That way YouTube knows that you enjoy this content and it keeps serving you up my content as I put it out into the YouTube sphere. And uh, also if you're listening on podcasting platform, make sure to subscribe and leave us a review as well. If you think of anything that you wanna see on the channel, any kind of content uh, outside of this show or that you wanna see in this show, definitely let me know that as well. Also check out the description because there will be a link to the show notes so you can check out all the articles that we talk about and some other articles that we don't necessarily cover. And you can read a little bit more into those articles uh, that we cover as well. So if you want to see a little bit more about some of the technical details or things like that, then that is a great resource to check out. If you're just wondering overall where they're at, they're at my on my website, johngood.com. And that's where I put all my content. So you can go there and uh, check out all the information on there as well as some other stuff that I offer too. So without any further delay, uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump into the first article. So first article, LastPass admits to severe data breach encrypted password vault stolen. So I'm sure a lot of us are aware of what's been going on with this so far. Uh, the popular password management service on Thursday, this is Thursday of last week, revealed that malicious actors obtained a trove of personal information belonging to its customers that included their encrypted password vaults by using siphoned, uh, using data siphoned from the earlier break-in. Also stolen is basic, basic customer account information and related metadata, including company names and usernames, billing addresses, email addresses, telephone numbers, and the IP addresses from which customers were accessing LastPass service, the company said. The August 2022 incident, which remains a subject of an ongoing investigation, involved the miscreants uh, accessing source code and proprietary technical information from its development environment uh, via a single compromised employee account. The fields the attackers copy, the companies explained, are protected using 256-bit AES encryption and can be decoded only with a key derived from the user's master password on the user's device. So yeah, so we kind of talked a lot about this uh, in the last week's episode, uh, last week's show, but you know, with LastPass, they weren't super uh, forthright, at least initially, right? They said that uh, they were breached and it was a non-production system or something like that. But, um, you know, the vaults weren't at, uh, at risk. Obviously, we know now that vaults were stolen. And we, we again, we've covered this a lot in the previous uh, episode, previous show uh, for last week. But, you know, it comes down to how secure is your password, right? And that's really the key that I wanna drive home because a lot of people have been talking about, well, we have to switch. We have to, we have to go with another service, another provider. Well, you know, think about what you're doing in that situation, like what kind of service you're using. If you're going with a cloud-based service, you're giving up some of that potential security, right? Versus if you have an offline uh, password manager, something where it's only stored locally, or where you upload that vault to. So if you put it in a Dropbox to share it or something, then you know obviously it's in there as well. But you know it still comes down to the encryption that's on the vault. So they're still encrypted. And then it comes down to your password. How secure is your password? A lot of people probably still don't have secure passwords, right? If you use a password that is reused, then obviously you're still at risk, right? It's a higher uh, probability that your vault is gonna be compromised. And if you use a long password, a long passphrase, like you should, right? A 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 character password, or passphrase, then it's gonna be significantly harder for that attacker to, uh, to compromise that password, 
right? And that's, you know, that's the truth with any key and encryption in general, is the longer that passphrase, the more complex it is, the more difficult it's going to be, right? If you have a 40 character password, let's just say, it's probably not gonna be feasible for that attacker to compromise that account or that password anytime in your lifetime, right? So it is crucial that anytime you use passwords, even if there's encryption on it, anytime you have a key on there, that is very secure, right? Length and complexity are key in that aspect. As far as LastPass goes, I mean, honestly, honestly, uh, I, I've seen worse, right? So, um, you know, take it for what it is. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily just jump to the conclusion that going to another vendor is just automatically going to solve all the problems, right? There's a lot of companies out there that you know of that you're using their products and services that probably are doing a way worse job, right? So keep that in mind. That's, uh, that's something that we always have to think about when we're a user or a consumer of a product and a service. Is that a good thing? You know, maybe not, right? But it is the reality of how things are. So keep that in mind. All right, so next article, hacker wants Elon Musk or Twitter to buy back stolen data. A hacker who's super activated on the hacking form, uh, Ryusha, Ryu, Ryushi, is, is urging interested prospects to buy sensitive details that were stolen from over 400 million Twitter account users. The hacker claims to have obtained access to the data through a vulnerability on the database and is ready to sell it for a hefty price of, get this, $400 million. Woo! What appears uh, strange in the incident is the hacker is also inviting Elon Musk or any Twitter staff to buy back the data to avoid penalties imposed by G uh, GDPR lawsuits ranging from 5.4 million to 8.7 million. The selling criminal also uh, tested that escrow payments will cover the sale and control of, of the form admin. That's strange, isn't it? I mean, it's always interesting when attackers come out and try to you know, hold companies ransom or hold people ransom. But, um, you know, <laughs> Twitter is kind of, uh, you know, having its own issues as far as the money that it's bringing in. And it's been having issues for a while. You know, $400 million, you know, come on, Let, let's be real. I'm going to guess here that that price is not going to be paid out, right? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Do you think that, the, uh, that Twitter is going to pay $400 million? Do you think Elon Musk is going to pay $400 million? I'm going to guess no, but I'd love to hear your guesses on that. <laughs> so, it's just, uh, you know, really? That's just insane. But I feel like also too, maybe if an attacker comes out with a super high uh, figure and they're like, well, we'll bargain for like this, right? $400 million is the price, but we'll bargain for like five, six, seven, eight million dollars. You know, uh, come on. <laughs> Next article, Facebook to pay 725 million penalty uh, to settle Cambridge Analytica data scandal on a legal note. Facebook, the business subsidiary of Meta Platform, has agreed to pay $725 million as a penalty to settle a long pending legal battle related to its Cambridge Analytica data scandal. The proposed settlement, reported for, uh, first by Reuters, is yet to be approved by San Francisco's U.S. District Court and might take at least a few more weeks to turn into an executable decision. So if you're wondering what happened and you weren't paying attention to social media and this whole scandal that was going on, Facebook sold its user information to a company named Cambridge Analytica, now defunct in business, and that company engaged some researchers in the year 2014 to 2015 to get the pulse of U.S. populace on U.S. 2016 polls through a quiz app uh, named This Is Your Digital Life, where information such as page likes, date of birth, gender, uh, location, and their interests on Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton was collected after building their virtual profile. So in a lot of these companies, these social platforms, what we're seeing is that privacy of data is not necessarily taken seriously, right? Um, you know, a lot of this data is shared with these other companies, despite what you've accepted, what you've agreed to as a user, right? We've seen applications where 
Um, there was also a scandal too here with uh, Facebook applications, where as if I as a user, if I accept um, you know the terms of an application, right, of a service, and it connects my Facebook account, then you also get access to all my friends and my connections accounts and their their information, right? Because whatever I can see, then you get that access too. So it's a huge issue. That's a huge privacy concern because that is not only um, first person opting in, that's also third party opting in, right? Because I'm opting in to also let you, uh, that company or service see my friends or my connections information too. That's <laughs> like, that defeats the purpose, right? Like that, dramatically expands how much access that you have as a company you know what are you doing with your privacy data how are you managing that privacy aspect with facebook they did a terrible job right like there's other words i'm sure that we can use to describe that that are maybe a little bit less uh youtube and internet friendly <laughs> but um you know that's a serious issue right like from a consumer standpoint from a trust standpoint that's a serious issue, right? Like how can your consumers, how can your users trust you if you're just going to blanketly allow access through third party acceptance, right? So, um, yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, I don't know if this is enough, right? I don't know if this is a big enough penalty. Uh, I guess we'll see what the courts say if they accept it. If they say, no, we're going to let you pay more. So, uh, this will definitely be something that I would um, say watch because I think privacy in general is going to continue to increase, right? Like we're going to continue to get more regulations that are related to privacy that are starting to be imposed on companies. And there's going to be a bigger focus on privacy if you want to stay out of the hot seat. So um, this is a great area also too to go into if you are looking for an area that's going to be emerging uh, in this year and next year. Uh, in, you know, in all the years to come, right, in the future, in the next 20, 10, 20, 30 years, right, privacy is going to be a big, serious issue. So definitely keep that in mind. If you're looking for an area that is emerging and then you want to get into from a career aspect, right, as far as careers, if you find the emerging areas and those are the areas that really take off, that is a very profitable and career fulfilling kind of pursuit, right? That's where you can make a lot of money because you become the expert in said area. And then, uh, you know, you become the expert, right? Like the de facto expert. So keep that in mind. Uh, next article, this is really interesting. <laughs> uh, military, device can, uh, military device containing thousands of people's biometric data reportedly sold on eBay. We've seen some similar things like this before. More than a decade ago, near Kandahar, Afghanistan, the U.S. military employed one of its secure electronic enrollment kits, Seek 2, devices for the last time. A, a piece of tech, a chunky uh, black rectangle, used to scan fingerprints and irises, so your eyes, was turned off and stowed away. That is until August 2022, when Mathis Marks, a German security researcher, bought the device for $68 off of eBay, a steal at about half the listed price. But that's not all. For the low, low price of less than $70, Marks had added, uh, inadvertently also purchased sensitive identifying data on thousands of people, names, nationalities, photos, and detailed descriptions accompanying the biometric fingerprint and iris scans of 2,632 individuals, according to a report from the New York Times. From war zone to government equipment auction, eBay, uh, to eBay delivery, apparently not one Pentagon official thought to remove the memory card contained within the particular Seek 2 that Marks ended up with. So yeah, so as far as companies and when you process data, one of the key things that you have to do, and it's even in compliance requirements, is you have to sanitize your equipment, right? Whenever you bring in a piece of equipment, you should know how to sanitize that device, right? Typically, especially in highly sensitive areas, typically, right? Uh, one of the key aspects is that you are going to have sanitization procedures. Typically, we call them things like letters of volatility or LOVs, and those will identify where memory is, 
what kind of memory it stores. So is it volatile memory? Is it non-volatile memory? And um, you know, what happens? Who can access that, uh, that location in memory? What is stored in that memory, right? So in this case, you know, pictures or something, right? Like user data and how to sanitize that device. Those instructions are crucial, right? And a lot of cases in sensitive areas, if you don't have those instructions, those uh, letters of volatility, then you can't release that piece of equipment. You would have to destroy it. And that's very important to understand, right? I mean, this is, uh, this is bad, right? Like this is not good. Uh, biometric data is going to be valuable, especially in the future, because that information doesn't change, right? And, um, but yeah, I mean, in your company, you should have that kind of detailed instructions because you don't want data to leave your organization, right? You wanna sanitize equipment when it's leaving, right? So if you were to ship equipment back to a vendor, you would go through the sanitization process. If you were going to uh, sell off that equipment, maybe ship it off to eBay or sell it to an, um, or give it to a nonprofit or something like that, sell it to another business, sell it on Craigslist, I don't know. Um, you should have those instructions and you should go through that process. You should never be releasing data or um, equipment that hasn't been sanitized. Like, it's just crazy. Obviously, the more equipment that you get, uh, the more risk there is in that process, but you have to go through that process, right? You have to sanitize equipment and handle it appropriately. Again, this is in compliance requirements. So for it to not go through that process is a violation of whatever compliance requirement you have, right? I mean, it's pretty simple, right? <laughs> uh, in you know, those kind of environments, there should be even more controls in place to, uh, to go through that sanitization process. So kind of crazy, but um, one thing that you'll see too is if you're interested in forensics, go on eBay, right? <laughs> go on eBay, do some forensics on those hard drives. Remember, you can't unsee what you see, but um, this is a perfect example of data leaking out, right? Like that's not a new thing, this happens, right? We've seen this happen with other equipment, other lots of equipment that are for sale, hard drives, um, yeah, like if you're interested in forensics, that's a great place to go because you're probably going to find some information, right? <laughs> so, uh, next article, TikTok admits, uh, TikTok admits using its app to spy on reporters in effort to track leaks. Chinese parent company ByteDance says four employees, both based in the U.S. and China, have been fired. TikTok has admitted that it used its own app to spy on reporters as part of an attempt to track down the journalist's sources, according to internal emails. The data was accessed by employees of ByteDance, TikTok's parent, Chinese parent company, and was used to track the reporter's physical movements. The company's chief internal auditor, Chris Lepitek, who led the team involved in the operation, has been fired, while his China-based manager, Song Yi, has resigned. They looked at IP addresses of journalists who were using the TikTok app in an attempt to learn if they were in the same location as employees suspected of leaking confidential information. TikTok, right? <laughs> like, oh, TikTok. For a company that is really trying to gain the trust of governments, especially like the US government, you're doing a really bad job, right? That is just, oh boy. You know, there is a lot of controversy already around TikTok despite this incident. And obviously TikTok has been trying to go through, trying to show um, that it's not biased towards China and showing them information and, you know, using them to target people. This is bad, right? Like this doesn't help your case at all. I'm sorry, you know, it's like this is, literally the thing that the governments are trying to stop, right? And prevent and make sure that are not happening. And then you go and do this, right? So obviously, yeah, I mean, clearly they're gonna fire those people or let them go because that just is like a slap in the face to what they're trying to do, but it really doesn't look good. <laughs> like, you know, it's, I don't know what else to say, right? How can you trust TikTok? Right, like this is really bad. 
This is just, this is targeting 101 of your users, right? Yeah, I just, you know, really, really bad. Oh boy. I just, <laughs> it's amazing, right? It's amazing what companies will do behind the scenes. And then it comes out and it's like, well, that wasn't us. We didn't do that because you got your hands caught in the cookie jar. Okay. Oh boy. Oh, TikTok. North Korean hacking outfit impersonates venture capital firms. Financially motivated hacking group tied to North Korea has been impersonating venture capital firms in Japan, the United States, and other countries in an effort to spearfish startup employees and related businesses, according to new research. In a report released Tuesday, security researchers at Kaspersky said the group, tracked as Blue Noroff by Kaspersky and Hidden Cobra by others, registered at least 70 web domains over the last year, mimicking the websites of real venture capital firms in Japan and other financial institutions. The sites function as phishing lures to deliver malware, and Kaspersky, uh, and Kaspersky believes that startup employees are among the targeted victims, as several decoy documents were crafted to look like job offers. The group appears per, uh, primarily interested in Japanese businesses targeting local venture capital firms like Beyond Next uh, Ventures, Z Venture Capital, and ABF Capital. They also impersonate a Taiwanese venture capital fund, as well as financial institutions, like Bank of America, uh, the Sumitomo uh, 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 Mitsu Banking Corporation, and the Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group. Okay, so uh, North Korea definitely tries to do these kind of things, right? We've seen them with job postings. We've seen them venture, venture capital firms. Um, you know, all in all, they try to really target specific industries, specific areas, because let's be honest, right? We know that North Korea in a lot of cases is very locked down and they try to keep certain things out and they have a lot of sanctions and things on them. So, you know, they try to take these kind of shortcuts and do things where they can. So I'm not entirely surprised. They want to really capitalize and try to take or steal uh, intellectual property and things like that. So they can kind of, you know, have it in their country. They can kind of sell it off. A lot of cases, they'll create their own version of it that is internal to their uh, country. So, you know, maybe instead of having like a, a Windows operating system or something like that, they'll have their own version, right? As an example. Uh, but they do that with a lot of products and services. So it's really not... Uh, you know, it's really not that random or different or new that they're trying to do that, but it is of concern if you're susceptible to that, right? Uh, specifically, if you're a Japanese business, I would be very careful, very, very cautious, um, because you know they're going to come after you, right? Like they're going to target you, and you don't want to be a victim of that and lose intellectual property, especially with like a venture capital firm, right? If it's a venture capital venture capital firm, you know. Typically, when you're working with those kind of companies, you want to, you know, have them be aware of some of the things that you're doing because they're going to invest in you, right? Or you think they're going to invest in you. And so you might tell them, well, we're going to have this product or this service, or we're doing it this way or, you know, whatever. These are our financials. I don't know, whatever, right? But um, yeah, be very careful when you get any kind of, uh, any kind of unsolicited uh, information or requests, right? That's pretty key. Next article, U.S. Probe, uh, probes how $372 million vanished in hack after FTX bankruptcy. Federal prosecutors are investigating an alleged cybercrime that drained more than $370 million out of FTX just hours after the cryptocurrency exchange filed for bankruptcy last month. The Department of Justice has launched a criminal probe into the stolen assets that is separate, that is separate from the fraud case against FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried, According to a person familiar with the case who asked not to be identified as the investigations are still ongoing, U.S. authorities have managed to freeze some of the stolen funds, the person confirmed. However, the frozen assets only represent a fraction of the entire loot. It's unclear whether the uh, infiltration was an inside job, 
as Bankman Freed suggested in interviews before his arrest, or the work of an opt opportunistic hacker keen to exploit the vulnerabilities of a crumbling company, the conduct could amount to charge in connection with computer frauds, which carries a maximum sentence of 10 years in prison. So, you know, with cryptocurrency and the exchanges and that arena, there is a lot of concern overall, right? There's concern with the, uh, the blockchain, the technology that's in place, the specific uh, cryptocurrency, right? This one was huge. FTX, that was huge news, um, you know, a while back, not too long ago. We talked about it on this show, actually. But, um, you know, cryptocurrency is still the Wild West, right? There's still a lot of issues in that space that have not been solved and they continue to kind of uh, come up. You know, in this particular one, a lot of money uh, left that cryptocurrency exchange. And it was a big deal. It's still a big deal, obviously, right? And I think this is going to be one to really kind of pay attention to if you're focused on that space, because... You know, we've got to figure out how to kind of solve this because it's going to continue to be an issue, right? There's new cryptocurrencies that are coming out and it hasn't solidified how to do a cryptocurrency, right? Like how to launch one, how to do this and make it secure because every cryptocurrency seems to have some kind of issue. So um, let's keep watching this and see what happens. But um it's not just this particular one that I want to pay attention to. It's the whole landscape, right? We really want to see how things kind of evolve and if regulations are going to be imposed. I mean, I think, you know, in 10, 20, 30 years, a lot of this might start to kind of be um, uh, hashed out and fixed. But right now, it's still very, very early and we're still seeing a lot of, a lot of concerning things in that space. Let's see here, uh, thousands of Citrix servers vulnerable to patch critical flaws. Thousands of Citrix AD ADC and gateway deployments remain vulnerable to two critical severity uh, security issues. They are CVE 2022-75510 uh, CVE fixed on November 8th, it's an authentication bypass that affects both Citrix uh, products. Attacker could gain unauthorized access to the device perform remote desktop takeover or bypass login brute force protection. Second bug is tracked as CVE 2022-27518, disclosed and patched on December 13th, allows unauthenticated access to attackers, perform remote command execution on vulnerable devices and take control of them. So patch your stuff if you have Citrix and you're vulnerable to this. It says there's 28,000 Citrix servers online. So pretty important. And uh, Chris Inglis to resign as National Cyber Director. So in general, you know, one of the problems with government in general is that there's a lot of turnover, right? And that's just because of how things are set up. People would go into different positions and typically it feels like maybe a little bit more common than other places, especially at the high levels, right? Because at the high levels, you know, you have the four years of like the president and um, like state turnover when those, uh, those officials are changing hands. So we see a lot of turnover in those kind of positions. Turnover is normal, but they also, you know, are responsible for a lot of large scale things, right? Especially at the federal level, those directors and, you know, heads of entities or, you know, departments and agencies and things like that, um, you know, that, that could be a concern, right? Because if they change hands too quickly, then maybe they don't implement enough things or the right things or have enough time to, uh, to actually make change in those organizations. But um, that's definitely one that to look at if you're interested in knowing more about uh, the government and things that are you know, in place and how things are changing and evolving in those spaces. But uh, that's going to be the last article for this week. Again, this was your Threat Intel Briefing for December 25th, 2022 through December 31st, 2022. Again, this is your last briefing for the year of 2022, and then we'll be back in 2023. And I'm your host, John Good. If you enjoyed the content, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you're watching or listening on podcasting platform, 
Make sure to subscribe and leave us a review as well. Check out the description for uh, the show notes. There will be a link to the show notes. It's on my website if you want to check out these articles and more our articles. But with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up for the year. I wish you a great uh, New Year's, and I'll see you back in 2023.